Just give him some praise here tonight. Oh, Rasiri di di andoro koto ya hinde ya, he are re ando ani ra toto, ya Rasi ando ya, yo roko ya ando ya, he are mo ni angan di reti, ya Rasu roko. a pool a pool like the one of the five springs at Bethesda it's as if in the middle of the water a, a toe touches and the ripples ripple out from the water it's what's called the troubling of the waters I just see it so clearly in my mind right now the water beginning to stir the place where miracles happen the place where the the unexpected the unplanned the uncontrollable takes place where God and man meet and God always wins friend there's a troubling in the waters right now and that's a very beautiful thing I don't know what your needs are, but I'm going to tell you, this is a beautiful time to take your needs to the Father. This is a beautiful moment right now to take your needs to the Father. Waters are being troubled. Prayers are ready to be heard. Miracles are ready to happen. Come on, take your need to the Father right now. Take your need to the Father right now. Oh, my God. I feel like there's some the Holy Spirit's bringing to my heart right now there's some you need somebody to stand with you you need somebody to agree with you for some walls to collapse some things to happen in your life I mean you're a candidate for a miracle right now I want you to come stand across this front right now get out of your comfortable territory come stand across this front we're gonna to want to agree with you in prayer right now if you have a need of God and you're saying, God, only you can do it. I want you to come out, just line up across here. We want to be able to get around you and start praying for you. Hallelujah. Come on, I need some prayer people to come right now. Hallelujah. Brother David, Sister Rhonda, would you come and join me? All my staff, I need y'all to come and join me. Prayer, prayer people, come on. Let's gather around these and let's begin to bathe them in prayer. Put a hand on his shoulder and let's just begin. Come on. 
Let's just begin taking some territory. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father God, we give you these needs right now. We give you these needs. Only you can meet them. Only you can do them. So, Father God, we're going to agree right now in Jesus' name for these needs to be met. We're going to agree right now for these needs to be met. As only you can do it, Lord God. As only you can do it. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken our mortal body. That same Spirit will energize our soul. That same Spirit is right here with us. That same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in this building. That same Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 Only you, Jesus. Only you, Jesus. Only you, Jesus. Only you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we take authority in Jesus' name. We take authority over these things. We command the enemy to let go and be gone right now in Jesus' name. We declare the victory of the blood of Jesus Christ, that finished work of the cross. We declare that victory to be ours today. Jesus. Jesus.
Jesus. Join me right now. As we've laid all these things at the Lord's feet. Come on, somebody tell him, Lord, it's yours. And I thank you that you're taking care of it. God, I thank you right now because I believe you are meeting needs that are unseen, Father. There are things that are about to happen. Lord, just as we had a testimony service, Lord, probably one of the best I've ever been a part of in my life. God, I'm believing more testimonies are being created in this moment. If we faint not, if we will hold fast, there's victory that's yet to be had. There's harvest that is yet to be garnered. There are things that are yet to be seen. If we'll hold fast and not lose faith, but in due season, in due season, these things will happen. Help us to hold fast, Lord God. Hold fast. Mm. Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of y'all may remember the old country philosopher by the name of Jerry Clower. He used to make a statement, wrote a book about it entitled, Ain't God Good? Mm. Ain't God good? You, mo you know, the moment you think you've got this whole playing church thing figured out, <laughs> God comes in and says, let me show you how to have church, son. I love it. Love it. I mean, I wouldn't trade this, literally. Come on, you've been with this journey. We've been on this journey together for months now. Months, months. Love it. I love seeing what God does. Had the privilege this morning to meet with about nine or ten candidates for water baptism <laughs> next Sunday. Remind me to fill up the tub. Justin, Pastor Justin, remind me to fill it up or you're getting in there in the cold water with them and I'm going to coach you through it. Hallelujah. The, uh, and I, I was talking to one gentleman. He, he was on the van. He couldn't get here for the, uh, for the class. So I talked to him after service and he began to tell me testimony of what God's been doing in his life. This is, this is one of our van, van folk, uh, David, David uh, Pierce. Is that his name, David? Is that right? Okay, David Pierce. And uh, he's, not, he's not here, so I'm going to talk good behind his back. Hallelujah. I mean, it's good to talk good about behind people's back. That's all right. And uh, he said, Pastor, I'm, I am in a place with God that I haven't been in decades. Decades. I haven't been in a church like this in many, many years. And some of you have seen him. He, he's got glasses, walks with a cane, uh, uh, dark hair, dark goatee. And uh, he, he told me, he said, uh, I, have, I have been dipping snuff since I was 10 years old. He said, I'm 60 years old right now. I've been dipping snuff for 50 years. Man, I ain't been doing nothing for 50 years. I've barely been breathing for 45. He said, I've been dipping snuff for 50 years. And he said, I asked God to take that away from me. And he said, now hold on. You Pentecostals getting ahead of me now. Wait. He said, 
He said, I asked God to take it away from me, and I haven't had a dip in a month. Mm. said, I haven't had a dip in a month. He said, as a matter of fact, I don't even miss it. I usually go to the gas station, have to get some stuff, and by the way, get some snuff. He said, man, I hadn't even thought about it. I hadn't missed it. I haven't wanted it. 50 years of addiction, and he said, I am free. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff. Ask, a, ask an addict how easy it is to get off of stuff. Man, you think it's easy. It's not. I mean, I didn't say a word. I didn't, but I let the Holy Spirit deal as he deals. Hallelujah. I am so grateful to see God on the move. And I'm grateful to be in a church that still wants to have church on Sunday night. Statement I heard the other day is many churches don't need to have church on Sunday night. Wasn't it being against it, but he just said, Pastor said, some churches don't need to do it because their worship's not near as good as Sunday morning. Said the preaching's not near as good as Sunday morning. Said it's just kind of a half-hearted effort from what Sunday morning was. And let me tell you something. I think our worship on Sunday night is just as vibrant in the Holy Spirit as our, sir, as our worship on Sunday morning. I sense moves of God and deep words spoken from this pulpit on Sunday night just as much as Sunday morning. Man, and we need it. I said we need it. I don't knock anybody else that doesn't have church and and regret those that can't be here on Sunday night because I know what my God does. I know what my God does. Mm. So I'm ready to see what else God has for tonight. I'm going to ask Sister Rhonda Johnson if she would come up here. Have you enjoyed that fresh bread from the oven this morning, Pastor David? Pastor David, that's good stuff, man. That'd make a tadpole want to slap a whale. That's good stuff right there. Hallelujah. Well, come on up. Don't act like you're afraid of me. You never have been before. Slap me around all those years. Goodness. Must have paid off. Here I am. Do you, uh, do you need the, this thing here? Are you? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. Well, I might. Do I need it? Well, I don't know if you need a woman's asking a man what she needs. That's dangerous territory. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right. So you do or don't? She does not need it. Thank you. So all, I, all I need is a woman to tell me what's going on, and I will never go wrong. Hallelujah. I get somewhere, and I, I'm like, there's not a woman around me, Brother Phil. I'm going to do this wrong, sure as you're born, because there's not a woman here to tell me. All right. I'm sorry, I preach was getting all on me. It's amazing what you say under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, David. Amazing what the Holy Spirit will have you say. I love this lady. I love her family. And uh, she can tell you a little more about, about the family since Daddy didn't tell anything about the family. We'll let Mama do that. They've got some very handsome, handsome young men. And uh, they've had a special addition into their family. And uh, I want her to be able to tell you, would you welcome the First Lady, Sister Rhonda Johnson. Give her a great big poem and welcome. I tell you, um, I jumped in that pool. I'm believing God for healing. And uh, I'm just so thankful for the worship here today, for the ministry. All of you who have participated in the ministry, you've blessed me. And I came and I pr I've prayed for months. Matt, uh, Mike and I um, planned the service months ago and I've prayed that God would make us a blessing to you. But if anybody has been blessed a scintilla of the amount that David and I have been blessed since we've been here, I'd count it a success. So you guys have blessed us. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt, Mike asked me to share about our family. Um, 
when we were with Mike at Faith Temple in Killeen, um, we had two boys, uh, Seth and Jesse. And Seth is now almost 30, and Jesse is 25. And uh, Seth is married. He's our only married child, and they just made us grandparents. <laughs> so they're gonna call, we're going to tell her to call me Granny, and whatever she says back, that's going to be my name, whatever that sounds like. And David is Santa Pop. So that's his, that's his papa name. So um, then we have a younger son who is uh, still in the area with us. He, he, does, he lives in College Station and he's a blend team student. So he's blend and A&M and uh, his name is Matthew and he will soon be 22. And God has just blessed us um, so much with our family. Our, our boys helped us when they were home. They helped us in ministry. And God is so good. You know, when they started getting older and busy, they worked in Young Life Ministry and they worked in all different types of ministries. Um, we wondered, you know, what's going to happen to us? Our boys were such a part of our ministry. And God, so awesome, like always, he just raised people up in our church and raised people up. And we, uh, we do miss them, but you know, we're doing great. I mean, the Lord takes, takes care of us and takes care of all of our needs. So we're really blessed with our family. We have a daughter-in-law who is like really and truly like one of our children. We just love her with all our hearts. So we're very blessed. I want to share a message tonight that's been 20 years in coming. And uh, this is about how God taught me how to love. And uh, I want to take you through my journey just a little bit, just hit and miss. And I've prayed and I've asked the Lord that, you know, I'm going to share a little bit and I want it to go a long way. So I just ask Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name that you would work deeply and quickly, that you'd help us to have ears to hear, hearts to know, eyes to see. And Lord, that every word that I speak, that you would help the full implication and the full meaning to be known in the heart. We ask for you to do a lot in a little bit of time, in Jesus' name. I want for you to think for a minute. Now, some of you are just going to, bam, you're going to have a name instantly. Some of you might have to think while I'm speaking, but I want for you to think, do you have someone in your life who is a challenge to love? We're not supposed to do that, are we? We're supposed to... We're just supposed to ooze love, right? We're Christians, and this isn't supposed to be hard. And we're just supposed to be having abundant life and bubbling over. But you know what? Sometimes, even those of us who've been saved and walked with the Lord for years and years, sometimes we have a challenge to love people. I was major challenged to love people and I'm ashamed to say that I would I wish so much that my testimony was that I've just always been so loving and no matter what anyone did to me I could love them but the truth is I went through a period of my life where I was severely challenged to love people and not not just people out in the world I'm not talking about the people that threaten you when you dr don't drive like they want you to drive I'm talking about the people right in the house of God Logic tells us that when somebody's mean to you, when somebody's ugly to you, you fire right back. You tell, you say something to me, well, I'm going to tell you what. That's what logic says. That's what, that's what our self-preservation says. Our self-preservation says to either fire right back at them or just to avoid conflict altogether. And that was more my method, and that was just to avoid it. I, if, you, if you said something that hurt my feelings, my method was just to try to stay away from you. You were like a loose cannon and a dangerous person, and so I would just rather not have to deal with you. And that would have been fine if I could have gone right along and loved people that did that, but the truth is I was challenged to love those people. When they hurt me, when they criticized me, when they demanded on me, I was became very, very calloused and very, very challenged to love God's people. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up.
is called Life of Love Ministries. My goal is to teach people through my experiences to love people, difficult people, easy to love people, people who don't like you, people who are mean to you, people who are ugly, people who abuse you, people who say ugly things. And this isn't always the, the people that you would expect. Sometimes it's coworkers, sometimes it's family. I know people that some of the biggest challenges they have are Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> I know people who Christmas is just a completely nerve wracking event for them. And God wants for us to be able to love anyone and everyone all the time because God wants to work in us. My answer, my idea, my logic was for God to fix them. They were broken, they were mean, they were ugly and God needed to hush them up and make them act right. That's what I thought needed to happen. And so I was constantly praying for God to solve people and their problems. And what I needed to know and what God taught me over this journey is, is that I needed to know how to love people no matter what they said, no matter how they acted, no matter what they did. And so this scripture really jumped in my heart when I read it. And the part that I want to talk about first is as dearly loved children. It says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. lives, either, either people in your lives or hobbies in your life, and you say, that's my life. Hunters, hunting is my life. Anybody? Quilting, quilting is my life. Shopping is my life. Video games are my life. All right, there we go. <laughs> so are there, what, what is it? Think of it in your, in your mind. What is it that you say, that's my life. My family is my life. Okay, well, I believe that this scripture tells us that God wants for it to be said of us. Rhonda, loving is your life. Loving others is her life. Now, her name was easy to remember because it's mine. So sorry, I picked on you. <laughs> but I believe that that is God's goal for us. And that is that our life would be what, what we are associated with, with peop, what people outside of this church and inside of this church and in your family and at your job, what people say about us everywhere we go is loving others is their life. And I believe that it, to be an imitator of God, that's what we become, that loving is just our life. Now, according to Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, all of us should be this way. All of us should live so that loving is our lives. But I believe that one thing that, that causes us to trip on this idea is that we think just, just where we are right now. I believe that if we interviewed the church at large in America, most of us, most Christians would believe and know and think that they had love all figured out. Sure, I know how to love. Oh, yeah, I know all about that. God is love. And we all think we know exactly how to love. When the truth is, even though we're the saints of God and even though we're the church, we are influenced by watching friends on television. We are influenced by watching One Life to Live. We think we learn how to love by watching commercials like where they say, you know, I love you, man, you know, and, and what's up, you know, and we, we are influenced by all of these common culture things that, and we don't realize how much common culture, pop culture influences how we express, think, and feel about love. But what I have found is that Jersey Shore and a lot of other <laughs> CSI and all the, the different shades of colors and those kind of movies and those kind of things, they influence us more than we think they do. And we start acting just like the world outside in that, at, remember what I told you? Logic says if somebody spits something at you, you spit it right back at them. And that's where we get this because in this soap opera culture that we sit in front of and watch and allow to feed us, 
we learn how to love and respond to people by our pop culture. And then what has happened, I believe, is there's no difference in how we respond in the church and there's no difference in that and how the world responds outside the church. And it's caused us to lose our effectiveness. It's caused us to lose our influence. John 1, 4 and 8 says, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if God is love, then his idea, his definition, and what he says about love is the truth. Absolutely. But love is about doing, saying, and serving others. It's not like signing up for DirecTV. DirecTV, we will, we will say, what do I get? Okay, for $100 a month, what do I get? Well, we tend to have that attitude a little bit, and we say, okay, so, all right, if I'm nice to her when she's mean to me, what am I going to get? She's just going to be mean to me again. Okay, that's not worth it. Never mind. No, that's not God's love. That's not how that works. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. All right, I want to repeat that. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. Putting ourselves before others is one of the most devastating things that can happen in God's house. God tests our heart to teach us. Early in ministry, I found out just how demanding and exhausting a life of service could be. I started in ministry when I was four years old. My uncle was a pastor, and I started singing in his churches. And one night we were at a big, and his churches were, were usually pretty small. And one night we were at one of his churches, and they had a big, it was Assemblies of God, and they had a big district event there. And so the church was packed. Well, this was different. I, had, I didn't sign up for this. And so there was a man that came around, and, and he was, anybody remember old-fashioned singings, you know, when everybody in the building took a turn? Well, that's kind of what this was, I think. And so there was a man that came around with a tablet, and he wanted to know who was going to sing. And so it, I had been practicing with my cousin who was playing the piano, and it was all set up that I was going to sing. Well, when I got there and I saw all the people in the building, I chickened out. And I said, oh, no, I can't do this. And so my aunt, you know, knowing that I was pretty vain, started trying to appeal to my vanity. She started pulling things out of her handbag. Would you sing for a pack of gum? I was like, that looks pretty good. No, no, I'm, I'm too nervous. Would you sing for my keychain? This is all real quiet during church. Then she got out her sunglasses that looked a lot like Jackie O's. And I was a little bit tempted by the sunglasses. But my mom pinched me and she said, if you sing, you sing for Jesus. Don't sing for any of Aunt Mary's things. And that taught me a lesson at four years old that what I did, I did for Jesus. So I worked in ministry from that time. When I was 12 years old, I was actually over the children's ministry in my church. I actually led it. I prepared sermons on a Fisher Price typewriter, which had red and blue ink. And Jesus' words, of course, were in red. And I started in bus ministry when I was a young teenager. The first thing I did when I got my driver's license was to go and visit my bus kids on my bus route. And I sang in the church. Anyway, I've worked in church my whole life. My whole life was about ministry and about doing for God. No one had ever complained to me about what I was doing for the Lord. No one had ever criticized me that I knew of for what I was doing until I married a preacher. And it became our life. <laughs> Suddenly, everyone in the building knew exactly what I needed to do, how I needed to do it, what I needed to wear while I was doing it, and every other detail about how to live my life. I was overwhelmed. I'd never, I hadn't experienced any criticism before. And suddenly, I was just like the focal point of everyone's criticism. We moved to a, to a town about 200 miles south of my hometown, and we were youth pastors. We were going to take our youth group up to my home church. The youth group was going to spend the night in my church and go to uh, Six Flags in Houston the next day. 
My little brother had been in a coma for six months. He was in a gunshot accident. He had just come home from the hospital right before we moved 200 miles away. My parents were having to turn my little brother, move him every two hours to keep him from having pressure sores. So my parents hadn't had a good night's sleep in over six months. So we were taking our youth group up to our home church. I was excited. I was going to get to go home, let my parents sleep all night long, and the kids had sponsors. We had youth sponsors. They were all certified teachers with the state of Texas. They were excellent sponsors. And so they were going to stay with the youth. I was going to stay with my folks. And the next day I was going to go with the kids to Six Flags. This was all great and fine until our pastor found out about it. He said, so you're not planning to stay at the church with the kids? I said, no, sir. I'm going to stay at home with my mom and dad. And the sponsors are going to stay with the kids. He said, I'll get back with you about that. About three hours later, I got a phone call. He said, Rhonda, I've called the board members and we voted you'll need to stay at the church with the youth. Now, I wish I could tell you that I had the mind of Christ and that I knew who I was in Christ and that I handled that really well. But the truth is, that made me mad for 20 years. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It honestly did. If I had known who I was in Christ... I would have been able to lovingly tell my pastor, Pastor, I love working in your church and serving under my husband's ministry, who is your youth pastor. But my husband and I, my husband who's the head of our house, he said it was okay for me to go stay with my folks. So I, I'm going to go ahead and go do that, and, and the youth are going to be just fine. If I had had a loving heart, I could have said that free of any kind of animosity, free of any kind of anger. But the truth is, I couldn't because I was mad. It made me furious that the board of our church decided where I was going to spend the night. We need to know who we are in Christ. We need to have a loving heart because we can react out of a loving heart and not let people misuse us. We're nobody's victim if we have a pure loving heart. But when we don't know who we are in Christ and we are offended at people's actions, suddenly we have just become a victim. And there's no greater place the devil wants to keep us than right there under his influence so that he can gig you and just rustle your feathers anytime he chooses. So when people with expectations would voice their disapproval with me for the next few decades, Disappointments, complaints, criticisms, all of those things challenged me to love people. I felt so under their criticism, so under their comments. I felt so under everything that they expected of me. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter what they said they wanted me to do. We want a ladies event, just like you used to plan at that other church y'all worked at. Okay, I'll do that. The ladies event was never enough. I always should have done more. I always should have, have planned it bigger, have invited different people. It didn't matter. As this became part of normal life, having constant criticism and expectations, no matter how many people were blessed, no matter how many people were encouraged, no matter how many people God moved on and did good things, the enemy had an inroad to me because I was lacking who I needed to be in God's love. Do you provide inroads? Are you paving a highway for the enemy to have direct access to your emotions and to your soul, to your spiritual well-being? If we don't love like God loves, we have paved a super highway to just allow the enemy to manipulate. We are so easy for the enemy. If we can be offended, if we can be upset, if what somebody else thinks of us can completely devastate us, then we have provided an all-access pass to the enemy, to our victory and our, and our freedom. All of us have friends and family in our lives that can do this if we don't know who we are. Do you have somebody in your life that just really can get under your skin in a pretty quick amount of time? Most of us do if we don't work on it hard. 
after years and years of this, I went to the altar one morning. My husband had ministered, and he had an altar call. I don't remember what the altar call was for, but I answered the altar call. And I went down, and in the building that we were in, it would have been at the corner of this altar right here. And I bowed down, and I started pouring my heart out to God. And I just started weeping, and I, just, I was just so broken and such a mess. I, was, I felt crumbled to powder almost every day of my life because someone was always disappointed in my performance as a pastor's wife, my performance as a church administrator, my performance as a worship leader, my performance as the daycare director, my performance as anything that I had going on, anything that I was working in. There was always criticism. There was always disappointment. And I always felt so completely challenged to love the accuser. I knelt that morning and I started pouring my heart out to the Lord and I felt the Holy Spirit come to me. And I call it my Solomon moment. Because as the Lord met me at the altar that day, he said to me, what would you have me do? I shared this with Mike and Andrea the other night, and I told them, you know, I, had a li I, could have per I could have delivered a huge list of things I needed from the Lord. There was no shortage of needs. But I quickly evaluated things, and I just thought, Lord, I think the thing that I need the most is I need for you to teach me how to love people. Because for some reason, they are able to just devastate me. And I can't serve you with joy and gladness because I'm always upset. I'm all my feelings are always hurt. I always feel crushed. So Lord, how do I love these people that are constantly devastating me? And that started a journey that lasted about 20 years. It started a path that eventually developed the ministry that today is Life of Love Ministries. There's three things I want to share with you that God has walked me through that are just most um, outstanding to me. And that the first thing is from Luke 6, 27 through 28, and it says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Now, I want to tell you something about praying for your enemies. I did this for years. And what would happen is I would pray for them and God would help me. And then they would hurt me again. And then we started all over again <laughs> because I was just getting through events. I was just getting from event to event, from episode to episode. I was, there was no change in my heart. We were just going from event to event, nasty word to nasty word. And so what I learned is that when you pray for your enemies, when you really open up your heart and you don't just pray your problem, when you don't just start, you know, just babbling and blurting out all the things that you're angry about. I mean, that's one thing. And you can do that. But what I learned is that God wants me to not only share my heart and share my hurt with him, but he wants me to listen to what he says back to me. Because what I learned is that when I prayed for my enemies. When I prayed for those who hurt me, when I prayed for those who despitefully used me, do you know what had happened? The Lord would help me to understand those people. The Lord began saying things like this. I want to share some things that the Lord has told me about people that I was praying for. First thing is their parents never taught them manners as yours taught you. Second thing, they were never taught to put others first. They were taught to look out for themselves. These are actual things that God has told me in prayer. This one I want to, to really get into your mind. I want to get into your heart, and that is the abuse in their past has blinded them and wounded them from being able to see things any other way. Can I repeat that? the abuse in their past. Jesus has a heart of compassion for everybody. When people offend us, there's a saying, I'm sure you've heard it, that is hurt people hurt people. 
okay? So these people who are so bombastic and harsh and sharp-tongued, they're hurt. They have offense and wounds of their own that they're dealing with. They don't have time to be careful and not say cruel things to us because they're so busy being hurt themselves. So the abuse in their past has blinded them and wounded them from being able to see things any other way, God told me. And this one is almost funny, but it's, it's an actual, it, it was an actual situation where a staff member was working against us so hard to get us fired. And the Lord kept telling me, I, I would pray for him. He, he also had a, a, another job outside of the church. And, and as I would pray for him and as I would intercede for him, because he was so awful to us, and as, as he would work to destroy the ministry that we were trying to build, the Lord spoke to me one day, and this is what he said, wait, give him enough rope, he'll take care of himself. And I read the story of Haman not too long after that. And then I started interceding for the man when he started getting into trouble, when he had enough rope to hang himself, when that was inevitable and that was about to happen. You know what happened? God had put so much love in my heart for the man who was being so ugly to us. I started interceding for him that he wouldn't get what he deserved. <laughs> and so God can change our hearts and completely change the way that we view a situation if we will bring our enemies to the Father and allow him to give us his perception, his view, and the very people that we're ready to take to the gallows ourselves. And sure, I'll kick the stool out from under them. That very person you'll be striving to save. That shocked me. That completely shocked me that here I am, just a few months earlier, I would have been happy to see this guy get in trouble. He deserved it. And here I am just a few months later, and I'm praying, oh, Lord, don't let this happen. Save this situation. And my heart was compassionate towards this man, which was a complete change from just a few months earlier. When you see things from the Lord's perspective, often, Instead of just finding out and knowing what someone did to us, we see things through the eyes of grace. And grace doesn't say what they did to us. Grace says why they did it to you. Why is this person so ugly? Why is this person so negative? Why does it seem like this person is never satisfied? And God shows you that there are reasons in this person's life. And instead of hating them and instead of wanting to stay away from them, we find ourselves wanting to love them and wanting to have compassion on them and wanting to help them. We find that we pray for our enemy, not just to rescue us from the enemy, but we start praying for God to rescue our enemy from the thing that's making them our enemy. Your enemy is not Satan, church. I'm sorry, your enemy is Satan. <laughs> your, your, your enemy is not your coworker. It's not your family member. It's not the person that's being ugly to you is what I wanted to tell you. Your, your enemy is Satan. It's the accuser of the brethren. It's the enemy of your soul. He's fighting to keep you from living the life God gave Jesus to die so that you could have. And God wants to give you this abundant life and the enemy wants to steal it from you and he wants to kill every good thing that Jesus wants to birth inside of you. And so we have to know who the enemy is. If we go around thinking each other are the enemy, then we're never going to have abundant life. We're never going to live a life of love. We're never going to live successfully for God. We're always going to be defeated. And God wants us to apply and appropriate the works of the cross of Jesus and have complete victory. I want for you to remember, I, I said this earlier, I want to remind you, these details that I'm sharing with you, my experience, my testimony is not about how God changed my enemies' hearts. 
Very little happened in the other person that I know of. This work happened in me. My enemies were still, listen, we've still got, we, we get letter, we got a letter just a few weeks ago we shared with, with, with the Sullivans of a lady who, who gave us some criticism and, and it affects us completely differently now. We don't even, I mean, it doesn't even have the same effect. We don't think of this person as an enemy. We see this person as having lack in their life and how that they need Jesus to heal them of some hurts and abuses. And so when, when we decide to live a life of love, we give God an open door to do work in us, to change us, to make us what God wants us to be. I went to work for Texas A&M uh, many years ago, and um, I was the marketing director for the Turbo Machinery Laboratory, which is just the study of rotating equipment. And I traveled all over the world. And uh, one of the first assignments I had, I had to go to Berlin, one of the first out of country assignments I had. And I got there a few days before my coworkers because I had some meetings that they didn't have. And so um, there was a lady in our office, I'm going to call her Jean to protect the guilty. And um, she, she was devastating to me. She worked against me uh, at every turn to make me look bad. Uh, she, she and I were pretty close to the same age. I don't know why, but she didn't like me being in the position I was in. She worked against me. She tried to make me look bad. She tried to get me fired. She gave false information to people. She used me to get information and then twist facts. I mean, she was quite a piece of work. And most of you are thinking that she is some devastated demon from some biker bar. And the truth is, she was a board member's wife at one of the biggest churches in town. <laughs> Taught Sunday school, led the little missionette Royal Ranger, you know, program. She was over the whole thing. I mean, she, she was known, she considered herself a top captain in the army of God. She was quite a challenge for me. So I got to Berlin a few days before she did, and I had been alone except for just working with colleagues over there. And so by the time she got to Berlin, I was happy to even see her. And so she said, uh, how about if we go to dinner together tonight? And I said, okay, that's, yeah, sure. Hey, some company, absolutely. So she and I went to, to dinner that night, and I had already decided I was gonna be very guarded because she had already proven herself to be no friend of mine. I mean, she had diligently worked to make me look bad. She had diligent, she had set situations up to make me look bad. So I had decided I am not going to befriend her. I'm going to have a very surface professional relationship, but I can enjoy dinner with her, I'll go. Besides that, I was really lonely. Like I said, I'd been in Berlin for a few days by myself. So we go to dinner and we have our meal and everything's fine and it's we're just about finished with dinner and I'm, I'm good, you know, I've had some company. I'm ready to go be by myself again. And she starts talking to me. And she starts sharing her history from her home where she grew up in a pastor's home of a successful church. And what no one knew was that her daddy, the pastor, had sexually abused her most of her life. And she started sharing intimate details of the torture and torment and abuse that she had suffered at her father who was so well thought of by everyone else and she had this devastating secret and I was completely confused I mean I really was I just sat there and I thought how could this person who has obviously positioned herself to be my enemy how could she be telling me such personal things what in the world is going on here and she continued to share and she continued to share. And as she did, the Lord opened my eyes. And the truth is, I got a little bit angry with the Lord because I realized what he was doing. He was showing me why she was the reason she was. He, he, was, make, he was helping her to open her heart to share with me so that I could love her right in the middle of her big mess. 
And I, like I said, uh, you know, I wish so much I could report to you that I just got up and hugged her. And the truth is I was a little bit just completely confused myself until the Lord made it clear to me. This is why she's the way she is. God was teaching me to see someone who had been so bad to me and to see them through his grace and through his eyes and to not just see what she had done, but to see why she had done it. Suddenly, I realized that the things she had done to me were nothing. The things that she had hurled my way, the things that she had set up, were so small compared to the things that she had suffered. We're on this planet for two reasons, to be loved by God and to love others. If we have any other purpose in mind, if we have anything else we're striving for, we're gonna miss the mark because God wants to love you so that you can love other people for him. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If me and it was she was so wonderful and we're going yes I was there I was there but you know most of the time when we bear with someone through something it's hard and it's difficult and we don't like hard things we we like push button answers to everything and we don't like bearing through things anymore after praying for those who offend you forgiving them is much easier Matthew 18, 21 through 22, Peter came to Jesus and asked Jesus, He was saying continuously. That's how often you have to forgive someone. Continuously forgive them. And when our heart is like Jesus, we continually love the Lord. Now, God was dealing with me about these situations and, and walking me through. I was growing and I was developing. And I, I knew that God wanted me to quit my job at A&M and he wanted me to start a ministry. I was well on the way to recovery and to having my heart whole again to being able to love people no matter what. And then something happened. I got a test. There was a group of ladies in our church who decided that they would impose some things on the Johnson family that was completely contrary to anything that had ever been talked about before in our ministry. And they decided to impose some sanctions on the Johnson household in our church. And this would equal to, now I'd already decided to quit my job at A&M, and what this meant was all the figuring and calculating in my mind of how God was going to use me in ministry and how I could quit my job, all their calculations made that where it didn't work anymore because they were giving us a gigantic pay cut. Not because the church was doing poorly, but because it was what was status quo in the denomination that we're in. And so they decided to, to cut our pay. And, and so now it no longer made sense for me to quit the university. But I felt in my heart that God had led me to do this. And the truth was they were aggravated that I had the audacity to think that I was going to quit my job and start a ministry when that didn't make any sense to them. 
How many of us know that God leads us each individually and sometimes things don't make sense to you that he's talking to somebody else about? <laughs> so this group in our church worked around. It, it, was, it was something that was done completely unconstitutionally in our church. It was something that was done completely out of order. And I'm a person who I love order. I love things to be done just right. And if you say you're going to do something, then you need to do it. And if that changes, we need to talk about it. <laughs> and so this event happened and the church voted and these ladies got their way and they cut our salary tremendously. It was no longer responsible for me to quit my job. And God ministered to me. And basically he said, step out of the boat. Let me show you what I can do. So I went ahead and I quit, which made no sense, and it made them even matter. <laughs> and so we began, began to walk this walk of faith. And so weeks and weeks went by, and I struggled to forgive these ladies who had done something that made no sense to me at all. It didn't make any sense for them to, to care whether or not I had a job. It didn't make any sense. But they still imposed this on our family. And I struggled and I struggled. And I would pray and I would say, Lord, I forgive them. I know they think that they're doing what's right. They think that they're being responsible with your money. They think that they're doing what's right. And I said, okay, I forgive them. And then I would go to church and they'd say something stupid to me and I would get all upset all over again and it would get all undone. And I would drive home <laughs> and I would go the back way because that way I could speed really fast and I could be, and I could just tell God all about it while I was driving down the road. And then we would go through it again and I would pray and I'd feel guilty and I'd say, Lord, I forgive them. I know. One morning, this went on for weeks and weeks. And this is where the Lord really delivered me from my issue of being challenged with loving people who challenged me. God woke me up one night in the middle of the night and he said, read the book of Jonah. I thought, the book of Jonah? It's a whole book. <laughs> you want me to read a whole book? It's like three in the morning. I didn't know. I forgot that there were only four chapters in Jonah. <laughs> but... I got up and I read Jonah. And when I got to chapter 4, verse 11, and when I read that they don't know their right hand from their left hand, God did something profound in my heart. And he ministered to me in a deep way. And it profoundly, and overwhelmingly came over my heart. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they don't know. And God reminded me of another time in scripture where we hear something very similar to that. And that's when Jesus was on the cross and he is looking in the face of the men who had just pierced his side. He's looking in the eyes of those who bound him to that cross with the nails. And while he's looking in the face face of those people. He says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that I'm your sinless son. They don't know that this is for the whole world. They don't know. And God convinced my heart in the most thorough way that when people who come against us when we're called of God, just as you are, and you're going out and you're trying to live your abundant life and you're trying to do what's right for God, and people come against you, they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the full effect. They don't get it. They don't know their right hand from their left, much less what they're actually doing. Then I continued to read and in the most admonishing and chastising voice I have ever heard from my heavenly father, God spoke to me the words that he spoke to Jonah and he said, what right do you have to be angry? 
I dropped it at that second. It scared me. I mean, it terrified me. I was terrified before a holy God that I thought I had a right to hold on to the offenses that people had done to me when the sinless son of God let go of the offenses that I've done. What right do we have to be angry? And I ask you, church, tonight, what right do you have? Yes, people may have been ugly to you. People may have abused you. They may have misused you. They may have tormented you. But compared to the sinless Son of God, what right do we have if he can forgive them? What right do we have to hold on to those things? And the answer is simply that we have no right. So if God Almighty can forgive us, then we can forgive anyone. Because when they sin against me, they're sinning against somebody just as guilty as they are. But when they sinned against God, they sinned against holy, pure, awesome God. And I want to ask you tonight, who are you holding in your heart? Who are you holding captive? Because the people who are hurting you probably don't even know they're, they're there. The people who are your biggest hang-ups may not even know that you are thinking of them, much less being challenged to love them. I want us to let it go. I want, my heart is to see Christians learn to love like God, let go. And I'm talking about tonight we have somebody in our mind. Tonight we know who it is. But you know what? In two weeks from now, it might be a brand new someone else. And we don't just need to let go tonight. We need to have a lifestyle, a life of love, where when people offend us, we don't say, I can't believe you said that to me. But instead we say, what would make a person say that? She must be really hurting. She must be really devastated. To live a life of love is to live with God's heart that looks at why people offend, why people hurt, not just what they do and what they say. Jesus said in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give you love one another. Remember the old commandments? Remember all the thou shalt nots? To be complete in Christ. We're free to live an abundant life. We're free to have everything Jesus died to give us on the cross, and that's healing, salvation, eternal life, joy, peace, love, long-suffering. All of those things are ours. I call it like grandma love. I can say that now because I'm a grandma, I'm like three weeks, you know. But, you know, you see a child in the grocery store, and they're throwing a huge fit, and, you know, I... I'm guilty of saying, if that was my child, I would just pop his bottom, you know. And, and, you know, you think, you know, that child needs to be disciplined. That child needs to be taught. And then that little child's grandmother walks up and, and is just, oh, honey, you didn't get your nap. That grandma is thinking why the child is acting that way, not just what he's doing. I'm just thinking this is driving me crazy. But the grandma sees why the child is acting that way. And the new commandment God gives us is the love that allows us to see why. Musicians, would, could I please ask you, to, would you all please come? I want us to lay down. I want us to lay down the people. The word talks about the sin that does so easily beset us. But you know what? Sometimes... That sin has a name and an address, and it's a person. And I want us to lay down the people that we allow to easily beset us. And I want us to set 
people free today out of our hearts and into God's hands so that we can live a life of love, so that we can live abundant life. Does that sound interesting to anyone here? Would you stand with me, please? Pastor, is it okay if I invite people to come and pray with me? All right, okay. If you have somebody in your heart tonight that you've really been challenged to love, challenged to have patience with, I want to invite you to come. I would like to pray with you. I believe that God will set us free, help us to love people in a way that we can't imagine, and allow us to live a life that's full of joy and abundance instead of captivity and hardship and disappointment. Would you come tonight? Would you let me pray with you? Brother Mike, David, would you come pray? Andrea, would you pray? Father, I ask for you to touch everyone in this room and I pray, Father, that in the next few days, if people come to mind or if challenging situations occur, I ask for you to bring this word back to our minds. And I ask for you to deliver us tonight, Lord, from the captives that have held us back and help us to set people free in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name. Forgiven because you were forsaken. 